And I'm going to try to pay attention to the chat, but um, I'll be more likely to stop if you like speak up. So if you have a question as I'm going, uh, please let me know. Uh, I didn't get a chance to prepare as much as I really wanted to for this, but uh, I don't know, hopefully you'll be okay. So this is not ready yet. This is not clean, but I'm making a, uh, a shiny module to, for inputting social media info. And so I got this working well enough. I just wanted to show this as, at the very start that what I'm planning to do is wrap this up into a really simple package that just has uh, stuff for social media in Shiny. Um, as far as I can find, that doesn't exist. So uh, we're gonna start making it. And it won't be done today, partly because I don't have the UI worked out yet, but um, we should be able to see kind of all the pieces of how to do that. Um, and so I actually have a different package open over here, but what we're gonna do is look at, use this create ID package. And um, I don't know, I can't remember if we've talked about this, but within our studio, you can, when you have, you're in the name of a function, you can F1 to load the help. And the really useful thing for exploring code, is you can F2 uh, to load the definition of the function. And so when I was in it and I clicked F2, this opened up up here. Um, and we can see like what it's going to do, um, which is basically, if we look at it, it's uh, going through and doing a whole bunch of steps, um, calling different functions within use this. Um, the reason that I'm not going to just do it, although, I feel like maybe this is updated since the last time I did this because, oh, uh, used tidy description might've been the problem. I don't know. It actually looks like it might just kind of work. So we're going to give it a try. Um, and then we're going to kind of back through or go through and see all the things that it did and why they were useful. So uh, shiny social is the package I plan to make. Um, and the copyright holder is John. Um, let me make sure. I guess the first thing I want to do is looking at the help here. Does it tell me what is name of the copyright holder or holder is this? Uh, okay, I should only change it if I use a CLA, so I won't change it. Um, okay. And everything else, we'll just use the defaults and see what happens. Oh, nope, nope, nope. And Okay, it gives me the help of saying, no, you didn't want to do that, John. Um, I don't want to put it inside of this package. So I want to do uh, that. Uh, no, I want to do that, which says put it up in my um, normal folder. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. And so we can see that it ran all this stuff and now it's going to open the package. Uh, and like I said, basically today we're going to go through what the heck did it just do? What were all those different things that it did? Um, and so I will put these next to each other, I think. Oh, and I'll... That's a little too big. All right. Is, it, um, is everyone kind of following at least what I'm doing? <laughs> so far, so good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, let me, uh, now let's focus in over here. Um, actually, I do want to see both of those. So first thing it did, be like I called it and it says, okay, it's creating this. So that is the, create package step. Um, and it also it sets the active project to that, creates the directory, create, it wrote a description. It used some things that I have set up in my profile where it automatically sets up the authors 
uh, the version, um, the license, I think, might be something I have set. Um, and let's see. So that's all through. That's still in create package. Um, okay. And so that's that's basically through. That's those two lines is through uh, there. Um, one thing that it uh, it does specifically do here is it says open equals false. Normally, if I were just doing create package, I would allow it to open in a new window. Uh, but it turns that to false, and it does that on lots of these steps because at the end, it's going to do that, but it wants to run all the commands and do that. So, okay. Um, next up, it does use test that. Um, can't remember if uh, Jack talked about this, but um, test that is a package um, for testing other packages, uh, also for testing other things, but primarily used for testing packages. Um, if you use it, test that, which you should you need to have this test so sorry again over on the left is the package that was created using these things so it added um it says okay it's adding test that to suggest field and description we can see that here we've got test that added um it's setting this addition field to three uh that is basically they did a thing they didn't want to do the same thing as um, ggplot becoming ggplot2, but it was a pretty major change at version three of test that. And so they introduced this idea of an addition of a package where um, I haven't even, I haven't looked at the code of how they do this, but basically test that has two packages inside of it. If you say addition is, if you don't say what the addition is, basically it uses uh the stuff the package that existed as of version two or addition two um and, but if you say three it uses the stuff that they added at three um that's you know complicated stuff that you don't have to worry about if you're just starting out just use version three it's better but they wanted to make it backwards compatible with old packages um it created this test folder and inside of that it creates creates the test that folder and the test that dot r you mostly don't have to care what that is, but test that dot R just libraries test that libraries the package you're trying to test and then runs this test check. Um, all of that is just this is what's needed for running tests. Um, and I guess, you know, because this is what the function is or the package club is. Um, so you can when you call this function, you can, can specify an addition. Um, Again, nor I've never, well, I did use that uh, argument for a little while when the third edition first came out because I didn't want to switch things up uh, in things that I was working at or working on. So that's useful. Um, I didn't even know this was an argument. Uh, that's interesting. Um, so again, that's what this club is for. So there's this parallel argument, which is false by default. This is something I'm definitely gonna have to look at after uh, like, you know, why would you not want to? I don't know, um, but by default, they don't. Um, and I wonder, so now I'm curious what happens when that is true. Um, but you'd guess, right? Like the overheads for parallel processing, if you've just got like a, package that's rendering some gg plots or something there's right no using parallel stuff okay and it so it would be it would have added this field config test that parallel uh and that's it so that's so if we wanted to uh with value true yeah so if we wanted to do this um believe that's all we would have to do um i will be looking into that like whether this is worth it um i think outside of the club uh because this is a separate package to dig, dig into um it so the other reason would be um 
if you have things that you create at the start of tests, those won't necessarily be available to everything, I think is what they're gonna tell us here. Um, and most of the time, like part of the point of tests is they should be fast. So, or, or not the point, but a rule about tests. So if you have to do testing in parallel, um, you might be doing things uh, wrong. So there's that. Anyway, so, okay. Uh, that is through use test that. And if we look at it, like this test that folder has nothing in it. It doesn't actually, you know, create any tests for us at this point. It's just saying, it's just setting everything up for us to use them. Is that, are we making sense so far? Okay. Sorry, I need to uh, pause my Dropbox because it can get in the way. All right, so the next thing it is going to do is, it's, oh, okay, right. It sets use MIT license uh, with the copyright holder. Um, if we go to this, so it says, you know, the license says MIT plus file license and that use MIT license uh, with uh, copyright holder not set to anyone specific. It creates this license file and then it also creates license.md, um, which is the like the rules of the MIT license. The MIT license is a really um, permissive license. So if you're creating open source um, things that you tend to like, or that you intend to really be like really open source, like people can do with, with them however they please, uh, MIT, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but MIT is what I, Tend to use it's what the tidyverse also uses um you still retain uh like your uh you know it is your package but people can do can copy it and change it and do all kinds of fun things with it at that point um and the, you're not yeah, a lawyer but do you know <laughs> say if you start with an mit license and then you switch <laughs> it up midway through yeah what happens then so uh I don't know, a couple of years ago, Tidyverse changed from, I think, Apache to MIT. And you can go back in the history of every repository that they have where they had issues where they had to contact everyone who had submitted to the package and like have them sign off on changing the license. Um, and I think that's probably true. Like. I, now, partly that might have been just that they did that to cover their butts in case, um, but it can be a pain. Like if it's sitting on your laptop and you change the license, obviously that doesn't matter. But once you have had um, contributions for sure, and um, possibly if you've had um, just usage, it can start to get dicey. I'm not a lawyer. I'm very much not. There is a whole packet or a whole chapter in our packages now about licensing. Um, so uh, Ethan asked about GPL versus MIT when you depend on other packages that have a different license. This is a whole other can of worms and a discussion that um, Hadley has, I've seen Hadley have on Twitter. Um, his way of interpreting it is that uh, like that package has the GPL license and your package is just using that package. It's not a um, derivative work of that package. And so you can still have MIT and then use a, um, a package that has other licensing. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Uh, if you're doing this like commercially, then you can start or you might have to worry about these things. I have had. Um, so GPL, the different the main difference is GPL has to have um, like attribution when you uh, like it carries along attribution. And so I have had um, it was a. a a data package that used data that needed to be needed to have attribution of the data. And so I made the package GPL to like bring that along with it. But then when I call that package, the interpretation is 
I can still use that package without um, losing it because the attribution is I have the description file that has the name of that package in it. And then that package has all the info to go further beyond that. Um, so yeah, uh, and I'm sure, let's see. Oop, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, F1, um, like, you know, they've got little tiny notes um, about everything. Um, they also do have CC0, CC BY. You, you know, you have all these options for licensing within use this. I, especially right now when I'm just working on stuff just kind of for fun, it's, I always just use MIT license. And so does the Tidyverse. So that's why it's in their, their function. Um, and just because you came in a little late, Ethan, it was fine, but I might not notice if you ask something in the chat. So feel free to just say things as I'm going through. Um, all right, so the next thing is use tidy description, which would imply that this is going to be one of our first steps that probably um, is fairly tidy verse specific. Uh, and so let's see if it tells us what it does. The problem is they don't have that good of help for a lot of these tidy functions because they're built for themselves and they train people on what they do. Um, and I don't think oh, it might. Let's see, use tidy description, puts fields in standard order and alphabetizes dependencies. Okay, cool. Like, uh, I'm all for that. So I have, I see no reason not to use that. Um, that's interesting. So I wonder, wonder if that does anything if you already have it. Oops, so I'm gonna save that. Use tidy description. Oh yeah, neat. I have gone through and manually uh, alphabetized things before. So that's kind of neat. That's nice to know. Um, so again, that's what this packet or this club is for is to actually read the help docs and learn uh, how things work. So, oops. Uh, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know how clear that was, but so use tidy description. One of the things it does is it'll alphabetize any imports and suggests that you have, and you can, it looks like you can call it without it breaking anything. So let's see, like if I change the version number and then I call it again, yeah, it doesn't do anything. It just loads in the description and cleans things up, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, the reason I have used that is uh, we have the book club repos where um, you users add packages to the description of the book club, which are packages that are used somewhere within the notes. Um, and it gets, uh, confusing that people are like, oh, has this package been used before? Do I have to add it to the description or not? No, partly you can, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can just do uh, use this use package. And like, I'm going to need shiny and it just adds it. Um, and so now I'll bet that imports field isn't supposed to be down at the bottom there by use tidy description. Let's see. Yeah. And so now I'll put imports up where it, like where nicely goes. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be using that because every once in a while I want to clean up the, the description files just to make them easier to read. Uh, and that, that'll do that. So that's cool. John, I got a, this is a question. It's something I probably know the answer to, but you know, when you're automating things to say our oxygen and your require namespace used to require for like a suggested package. I think the other day I was saying like that if I was requiring namespace, I didn't want to use, I didn't want the package to import, right? So I didn't want to add it to imports through like using dependencies and whatnot, but it wasn't automatically updating my suggests. And I didn't, I don't know if it used to. So you were using, what was it? Uh, it's like require just, namespace, right? Um, just the, the base function. Yeah, and then say if you if you use underscore package and you type in 
shiny, then that gets right. added to your imports. Could be that right. just in use underscore package, there's an option to say suggests or yes, import. Yes, there is. Ah, okay. So type imports is the default. Yeah, okay, nice. But you can that say- what I've forgotten. Yep, yep. Oh. You can also, so something I do, um, I don't do this for like CRAN packages, but I used to do this a lot for um, our work packages. So we could kind of keep track of, so like poor man's um, R end uh, that if you do min version equals true. It, uh, it sets it to be whatever version you have installed. And so, oh, I've got shiny 174. It says you need shiny 174. And we had a rule that we did that because, okay, maybe I don't actually need 174. Mm -hmm. But if someone else is using it, they should have at least 174 if that's what I was using when I built it. Um, yeah. Do you, at do work. You, are so. you familiar with use underscore latest underscore dependencies? No. Like, oh, so yeah. If, right. Um, to say if you didn't do that and you got your, we, you, yes. um, you don't know so, what you're doing and you imported 50 packages and none of them have versions. If you do the use underscore latest dependencies, it will add. I think your latest version, right? Or maybe it's Didn't they get it from Cran. I don't know. Um, um, and let's see. So I need to give it a little bit more space here. So yeah, overwrite is false by default. So let's say, and let's. Uh, yeah, if you've already got the number. True. Yep, there we go. Yep. Interesting. Wait, yeah, so I, there. Sorry. Okay, so if we go to um, let's let's get rid of this first. So normally, I'm saying import. I imports shiny is telling uh, the installation process that when you install my package, you need to make sure they also have shiny installed. Yeah. If I just say shiny, version doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and if I use this use latest dependencies, it'll look at what I have installed and put it there. So how is, is that different from your um, min version equals true? It it's the it lets you do it later. So um, oh, it got would it. go through, yeah, it goes through and adds it to everything in your description. And then, yeah, the other piece was if I already have something specified, use latest dependencies by default, will not overwrite that. But if I tell it, to overwrite, it will update the version number. Okay. Um, um, so this <laughs> reading the description of this function is not really clear to me what's going on. So, yeah. So yeah. Is the point as as determined by source? So what's the default sort local? So it's saying it local. It's saying your your latest version. That's yes, local exactly. Means? Okay. Yeah. And, and oh, that's a good point that I, I think you could add cran there. Up to date. Would... Yeah. Um, source equals is it all caps cran. Um, and so, yeah, you can see that was a little slower. Uh, oh, and it changed it on disk. And then, yeah, it went and checked cran to see oh, what is the latest version. Latest shiny. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just uh, submitted something to CRAN the other day. And so I made sure everything, all of my stuff was up to date. Okay. Um, yeah. Can we have one, well, I'm gonna ask a question if it's too much of a tangent, don't go there. <laughs> but Jack's comment about the, his use case for some namespace thing. I didn't follow that, I think, cause I don't thoroughly understand uh, namespaces. And I think that sounds yeah. important to me. So if there's time to go down that slight tangent, I wouldn't mind it. But if not, I'm totally happy to. So the, the sh I'll do a short version and okay, then we'll see if we can go into a long version. Uh, he was saying that he has, uh, let's say we have something, um, uh, I don't know, like, you know, whatever. Another package is we have this package that so, some function that we have uses this package, but it's optional. The, the, you don't need to install it. There's this uh, require namespace function, which um, basically you can use to check that they have that package in. If they have that package installed, then you can do this uh, other function or you can use this argument or you can do whatever you might need. Um, 
so I think um, probably I'm trying to think of something that I have that has this sort of setup. Um, there's this function or this package good practice. This probably has it. Uh, no, okay. Um, yeah, no. Uh, I don't have a good example, but the you know it'd be like um, let's say you have a package that also has a shiny app with it. So you could put shiny in the suggests, and then if they call that function that generate or that loads the shiny app for your package, it would check that they have shiny installed, and if not, it throws an error message and tells them, "Hey, you need to actually install that." Um, okay. It is. It's considered good practice to put things in suggests like if you can, like if it makes sense to, because you don't want to require that people install something and then they don't actually need that. Oh, yeah. actually I know an example. Um, whenever, if I reinstalled, I have it reinstalled, but it's here. Um, There's also like, you don't want your package to depend on as so many things, right? Like you don't want right. it to break if, if one of 30 things breaks, when you could have it, it would only break if like one of two or three or four or five things yeah. break and the rest just get suggested. Right. Um, okay, it does, okay, like, Plumber was briefly going to be going into suggests for Vetiver, um, so I thought that was going to be a good example, but it isn't because uh, it hasn't made it there yet. Um, it, there's a, a fine line to walk because you also don't, like, if it's something that, you know, basically everyone who uses your package is going to want for example that um if the kind of the main purpose of your package is that shiny app but okay technically you could use it without that shiny app it's a little bit of a judgment call there of because if it's in suggests then it won't auto install and i've had things that are kind of a pain where it's like obviously i wanted this other package but you put everything in suggests to make your package seem like it was lighter weight but really you need this other function yeah. or this other package um so yeah there's a a little bit of a balance to to walk there so that makes sense yeah Do thank you, you. I think test that is a really good example right like nearly everyone who's using your package isn't going to develop it or run your tests right so right you, they just don't need test that um <laughs> for you while you're developing it you definitely do and if someone wants to develop well they will need it but it doesn't have to ship as like the the default version Right. And um, there is this um, DevTools function, install devdeps, which uh, goes through and it basically it installs everything that you need in order to work on this package. And so it will go through and install the suggests um, and it'll like find um, it, it basically just makes sure that you're ready to work on a package. I use that one a fair amount. Uh, for example, with book clubs, if I look, if I need to be able to render a book club, you can call that install dev depths to kind of update with anything that has changed in the description. Um, all right. So, the, you know, again, already fruitful because I really like this use tidy description that if I had, you know, come through and let's say I had manually or whatever, something else that I did added this encoding field that wasn't there already, I can um, recall, use tidy description. Oh, let's save for that. And it puts it back like, you know, quote unquote, where it's supposed to go, where, where it is in the tidyverse way of doing things. I like that. All right. Uh, so the next thing it did is this use readme RMD. Uh, set with open equals false, because again, it's calling all of these things uh, before opening the whole project. And what that did is it created this uh, readme.rmd file, which is a um, kind of default setup of um, info about your package. Um, interesting. It So it used to fill in more information about how to install it, but I think they've had more people using things other than GitHub, so they don't 
make assumptions about how to install it anymore. Um, and then it had, you know, puts in the section for examples. And um, oh, it actually it doesn't do the uh, code of contact conduct like it used to. Okay, um, so it does that. And the other thing it does, I think, oh, it doesn't. Um, right, because I don't have this set up in Git. But so if you use readme rmd after you have git set up it sets up a hook that doesn't let you um check in the readme.rmd without also rendering it to make the md i wonder if they have moved more towards just doing that through github actions um so we'll get to that and see um so yeah that just created this file um there are other things in here like this lifecycle badge or the CRAN badge. Um, that's it. That um, these got added to that file. You know that's why they come after it after that call. Um, they get added to the uh, to the file. Um, let's go ahead and render it. <laughs> oh right, and I can't render it because there's no shiny social package. I haven't actually built this package yet because the package doesn't do anything. So we'll come back to that later. Um, like I mentioned, the next thing here is this used lifecycle badge. Um, they have this whole, uh, it's actually a separate package. Oh, actually that's a, probably an example. Yeah. Um, Actually, I guess technically you probably don't need the lifecycle package to use this, but there's um, there's other stuff that they have going on here. Um, but yeah, lifecycle is this package that oh, I lost my thing uh, that does uh, oh, let's try this one more time. Um, it, it has like these these um, st statuses of experimental. Um, oh, and yeah, that's, so stage is experimental, stable, superseded, or deprecated. Um, the general idea being experimental is before you're at uh, version one or before you're, you know, while you're still maybe messing things around, the um, order of arguments or the, the arguments themselves on functions could change, like things are, could be, could be wild. Stable is you've got it at least mostly sorted out of what you're going to do. Um, superseded and deprecated, normally you wouldn't say on a package, but on you can also put these on functions. And a superseded function is um, still maintained at the state that it was at when it was superseded, but it doesn't get updated. Um, and there, basically the idea being that, oh, we came up with a better way to do this. So this function is now superseded and deprecated is, hey, this function is still around, but it won't be forever. Um, you should use something else. Often, I can't, so I think the main, I, I can't think of an example, like most of the time they supersede now rather than deprecating. Um, actually, there is a thing in Shiny where there is something that uh, it uses a library that has a bug or had a bug in the version that's in Shiny and they moved the whole thing off into its own package. And so there's a whole discussion now of it, it's currently superseded and they wanna actually deprecate it and get rid of it because the version that's in Shiny has this bug. Um, but by the promise of superseded, it's they're supposed to maintain it at that level. It's like, yeah, it's a whole thing. And so um, that one, I think they are going to finally just actually deprecate it, say, stop using this function. You should go use the one that's in this other package because it deals with the bugs. Um, sorry, that went off on a whole tangent. All that actually did here is it adds this badge, which we can't actually see, but um, it, it puts a thing in your readme of uh, this is an experimental package. And it you know lets you click through and see what that means. Oh, hey, there it is. <laughs> so it puts that in the, in the package. Uh, any questions about that one? All right. Next one, likewise, is use CRAN badge. I'll bet, yeah, that's the same help article. Uh, that just puts this 
image in, which is the um, status of your package. What did I do? It was just hover to get it to show the image, right? Do I click? Why well, won't it come up? Um, because what this is going to do is it would say CRAN, uh, you know, no or not published, something like that, um, because this package is not on CRAN. Uh, but it makes a link to CRAN in case, like if this exists. And I got to see that today. And actually, let me um, let's see if we go to uh, 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 this brand new package of mine that went on to CRAN this morning. Um, yeah, it still says CRAN not published because that site has not up updated it yet. But if you click through, it is published. Um, so that's what that does. Eventually, this image will update uh, because the image that it's loading um, will uh, update. But so far, our package.org has not updated yet. Um, all right. So John, Any, um, quick, yep. quick question, if I could go back to the the uh, lifecycle badge. Um, yep. so if I if I get it right, this is um, not introducing into any dependency on the lifecycle package. It's just injecting this uh, this this badge is HTML into into our, our readme. Um, that's I guess kind of first question. And second question is, do you happen to know for the lifecycle package? Um, I was kind of scanning this on my own as as, as we we're talking about this. Does that have a different scope? Does it basically help you put lifecycle badges mm -hmm. on functions and not on the overall package? Yes. So. Um... It, the lifecycle package does, so it has all this stuff, yeah, about like when you deprecate it, um, set up the function with all the stuff that it needs in order to tell people that like when this is going to go away. Um, and let's see, there is a, it's not in here. It must be a use this or dev tools function that wraps it. They have, um, like there's a function, was it deprecation advanced or something like this, like that? Um, maybe it's a depth hmm. Uh Um, I could find it if I take the time to dig enough that there is a, um, let's see if I'm over on this window, I should be able to find it. Uh, there's a function that they have that, um, Oh, I thought it was automatic, but it's something that they say to check and there's a whole thing. This is in, yeah, in the lifecycle package. Um, so there's these like levels of deprecation that have you, as you have new versions of the function or of the package, you like advance through these levels and eventually the package or the function will go away. Um, and then, yeah, I think this has some stuff for cleaning up your code things like that. So you don't need the package in order to uh, add the badge, but for the function, like actual usage of the life cycles and enforcement of the life cycles, you use the package. Did that clarify it? Perfectly, thanks so much. Yep. You're welcome. All right, and let me get my window back up. All right, um, so yeah, use CRAN badge, made that CRAN, uh, uh, status piece. Um, use CRAN comments is, I, I think it's interesting that they create that right off the bat. That's this, oh, sorry, that it happens to be over there too, but uh, it created this that uh, telling in case I ever submit this to CRAN, it builds in this one note that this is a new release. Um, it wants to make sure that you have that set up. Really, it's it's kind of funny that it does this automatically to me because you should also run the command or the, the check before you submit to CRAN and you might have more to say here. So um, you might have more than one note, for example. Uh, it, you might have a particularly large package uh, to submit, things like that. Um, but yeah, they, they set this up and this is just something that is used in the submission process to uh, communicate with the maintainers at CRAN. Um, 
say say if you run check this doesn't set up some kind of automation right that it will actually it doesn't no. results okay yeah um i think partly because like if you have more than just this one note you probably want to say something more mm. than just what would come up automatically um you know uh one of the notes that you can get that is still like you can still get accepted but you need to kind of argue for it is if your package is larger than I think four megs, something like that. Um, and the thing that they tell you in the our packages book is basically, if it's gonna be a big package, they don't want it to update that often. And so uh, you should you know explain that, yeah, this is a data package, it'll update annually or that kind of thing. And then they would probably let you through with the larger package. Nice. Uh, and so would you so would you I because I've kind of I've put this manually. I didn't know this was a function. <laughs> I put use yeah. Um but like do you how do you actually argue? Is it just in there? Like say you've got the note. Um, yeah. Um you just start typing underneath, like yeah. oh, this doesn't matter because blah 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 blah. It basically, know. yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think if I've had one. Yeah, so yeah. Um in each edition that I uh, submit, I explain why. Um, yeah, <laughs> so this one, for example, had a special note of it was submitted the same day as the package was accepted because a like the tests all passed and then one of my dependencies updated wow. while the package was being accepted and it changed, it made a test fail. Um, and so I had to do a, another version right away. So it, that's um, this was all just kind of following advice in the art packages book of just put some notes in there of why is this coming in, uh, what's going on. I, I end up um, basically repeating what's in my news file, um, which we don't have here yet, but that's another another piece. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the idea, I guess. Um, Oops, I can you do that? All right. Um, oh, right. I maximize that because then we're through the CRAN comments and then it does this UI to, to do function, which is a, um, I think that's a, is that exported? Yeah. Uh, oops. That's not what I wanted. I just wanted to do one on that. Um, darn it. And we lost the. Um, UI to do is just like it generated uh, these. And part of what it does is it makes sure that it's like, okay, we're in the middle of a, uh, or I, I guess it just adds the red bullets. That's really all it is, I think. Um, and it has rules about uh, how to like display things, um, which is again, nice. I like these um, UI functions I didn't know they were here and use this and the uh I could imagine using them for my own like um productivity packages that I use for myself for like some things that I had created at my former job things like that to just make messaging clean and easy or clean and nice um yeah, and it tells us cool. yeah it tells us all these other things that we need to still do that it can't automatically do as part of the setup because it's it has to be working within that project. Um, and so, uh, it, and then, sorry, and then finally, project activate, uh, it opened that package. All right. But it did give us this list of things that we need to do. So let's go over, back over on Shiny Social. Um, one thing, so uh, a thing that I do that they that is not default is um, I like that. So they do have generate documentation with Rockstation. I think that's my own. I, I can't remember if that's a setting that I have set or not somewhere. And I like to do it whenever I uh, install and restart the package because otherwise you can get things out of sync where you've changed something, like you've exported a function. Um, but you haven't redocumented. And so it doesn't actually export that function. And so I do that. That's not something that the tidyverse team does. 
think partly why they don't do that is some of their documentation is really complex and takes a long time to build. And I still have never had a package where that's true. Um, and so I always uh, redocument anytime I build. Um, and uh, yeah. All right. So any questions before I continue? I'm going to move the um, the window where this all happened over off screen um, and maximize over here so we can see what I'm doing, maybe even zoom in a little bit. Okay. Um, so the, the first thing it tells us to do, again, these ones are things that can't happen in the other uh, our session or our studio session, it needs to be in the project that it created. And so it does use Git or it tells you to use Git. Um, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, this is basically taking this repository that we have now, this, this folder, it's not a repository yet, uh, this project and just setting it up with Git. So it says, oh, um, there's a whole bunch of files here. Uh, or I guess the first time, it, the first thing it's doing it sets up a Git repo. It adds all these um, files to Git ignore. Um, it uh, then it sees that there are all these uncommitted things. Can I commit them? Sure. I'll let it do that. And it needs to restart our studio uh, so that we have a Git pane up here. So yeah, I'll do that. Um, and yes, I want to quit. So there we well, go. What's the difference between two and three here? Uh, nothing. So <laughs> that is actually, so um, this is a, a little bit of a side quest here, but um, let's see. Is it, is it like so, an in-joke? Like there's... It's not, a, it's not purely an in-joke. So it's a, I'm trying to find the, um, yeah, UI nope. <laughs> uh, so this function, and actually, um, it isn't used this. I was thinking it was in a separate package. So they intentionally put two twos and one no and shuffle the order so that you can't just get in the habit of hitting one. You have to actually look for the one that says yes. They also intentionally have a bunch of different words that mean yes and different words that mean no because it makes you stop and go, wait, do I, wait, I didn't want to do that. What was I thinking? Um, mm -hmm. So there is a logic to it. Uh, I wonder if people still just tap one anyway. Like, <laughs> but if you if you tap one, it you might, might get a no, get yeah. a no, and then it'll stop. So, um, yeah, I it's interesting. I did see. Um, I think it's an issue in use this that uh, something I had never thought about. Apparently, this can be a problem for non-native English speakers that they're especially confused by what they're supposed to do there, um, or they can be. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you get that there's something funny going on, right? But I, I mean, I asked because I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you might not exactly if you're not a native. Ex yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's what that's all about is just to um, to make you think about it. Um, so, yeah, we did use Git. Um, the next one it is going to tell us to do is use GitHub. Um, I'm so let's go ahead and load the help on that one. Um, again, I think we had talked a little bit about this, but uh, this is going to set up the re repo on GitHub as opposed to just the local repo that we have at this point in time. Um, one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to let R4DS on this package. So I'm setting organization to R4DS. Um, it's not private, and also the visibility is public. I I think it's funny that they have both of those. Um, oh, okay, it's uh, GitHub Enterprise, okay. So this visibility is for if you have a paid uh, GitHub Enterprise account, you might need to use that. Um, likewise, the host would be for if you use something else. Uh, auth token is deprecated, credentials are deprecated. I always just, you know, basically just use this. Um, and if you're calling it for yourself, you probably just need uh, use GitHub. I did find it interesting that in their 
you know, in the things it told me to run, it has use GitHub and then use tidy GitHub. So we'll see what use tidy GitHub does in a second. So, all right, use GitHub R4DS. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, I want to check. No, they didn't put a contribute code of conduct there, and we don't have it yet. Okay. Um, so it's going to use GitHub and it's going to, uh, it's setting up this uh, project, creates a GitHub repo. Uh, there's an uncommitted file. Why is there an uncommitted file? Because if you look here, it just put in the description a URL and a bug reports link. Um, is it okay to commit them? Uh, yup. And, oh, and that actually loaded over in my other window. So it did this, um, and it's funny because like, you know, it's getting the about is what the package does. Uh, readme.rmd isn't rendered yet. So there's no actual readme dis displaying. It's not that great of a setup yet, uh, but it exists. So that is what that did. Um, I'll just move that over to the side. Um, and this one, a lot of times these functions will tell you something to do for follow-up as we've seen, and this one doesn't. It's just like, okay, uh, cool, now let's move on. And this one I want to actually look at before I call it because it could do some weird things. Um, I wanna see what all it does. So yeah, that's um, some of these, like this use.github is an undocumented or an unexported function, looks like, but it's not. Hmm. Uh, use this, use that. Nope. So use that GitHub. Um, oh, okay. That's just setting up a directory, a dot GitHub directory. Um, that's no big deal. So, whoops, we will do that. But I want to. Uh, what is it? It's used tidy GitHub. That's what I need to do over here. Um, so that one I, I'm okay with. Use tidy contributing. Um, that one is mostly fine. And this is actually one of the um, very few issues that I have with this whole selection of things. Of um, like you could almost just in, just run this uh, or follow these instructions straight through. But tidy contributing is going to put a contact in, uh, address of um, you know, our studio or something. Say the tidy issue template, I'm actually mostly fine with. Tidy support, I think that's the one that uh, explicitly is going to um, like tell you to go to, uh, uh, I guess it's posit community now, things like that. But yeah, good enough. I can clean up after what it does. So let's just run this and see all the things that it does. And, and again, if we go into the actual help for this, it's just, these are the tidyverse things. They're strict. You probably don't want to do them. And I really like, I want to go through and submit a bunch of PRs um, because I want this to be better. Or I want these to be like, you know, all of this you could almost use for every package you run, except that, that now we're going to look at, we've got in this dot GitHub folder, code of conduct, like we do. Yeah. Uh, for enforcement, code of conduct at rstudio.com. Um, I think that's the only one there, but if we do like uh, search through everything, I'll bet, yeah, uh, this code of conduct has it. The issue template mentions our studio, the support mentions our studio. So these things I'm gonna go through, and we're almost out of time, but I'll go through and like clean these up to be about my stuff. Um, and one thing I did wanna do before we go is um, that we added those fields and I, I think that they should add a, uh, an update to this of, yeah, let's put URL and bug reports where they go. Um, and so when it added those fields, it should um, then like reorder things. Um, let's see, we didn't get through, uh, I'm gonna actually go ahead and run this one. So another one, this one might make me check things in, we'll see. Um, nope, good. Um, So this is setting up, uh, automatically setting up GitHub Actions within, so I'm in the stock GitHub folder 
and it's uh, made all of these work or set up all of these workflows in the folder. And I think all of these, you can just let them run as is. Um, yeah, so that, so that uh, one of, actually, let's go ahead and look at all of the actions that it's calling. Um, so it's doing use coverage. Um, it's doing this, it's using this check full thing. It's using a badge for the command, our command check. Um, and so if we look at the, the, the description, or not the description, the readme, um, we have some new badges now that we have a code coverage badge. We have a, a RCMD check badge. So it did those. Um, it is, uh, it sets up package down, which this is the one that um, like for a couple years, I avoided learning how to use package down. I was like, oh, I don't have time to learn how to do that. Someday I'm going to take the time to do it. And finally, I just like, you know, looked at uh, use package down, it's, which just does it like you, there's nothing to learn how to do. It sets everything up. And so that was part of what it just did is it, um, it set up, well, it set up the action for it. I don't think we have yet. Uh, oh yeah. And, and so um, one of the things I didn't run is there's a use package down GitHub pages, which also sets up package down. And actually um, I'm going to call the last two functions just to have this done. There's use tidy GitHub labels. It goes through and renames a bunch of labels within your repo to make uh, your um, like options of what to do in issues better. So we look at now in our issues, uh, we can go to labels. And so it made these things. Um, they use emojis so that they, they're easier to find. It made this tidy dev day one that doesn't work for me. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, so it, it does all that. And then the last one so that I can let everyone go now that we're out of time is use package down GitHub pages. So that goes through, uh, if we didn't already have the um, action, it would add the action. It sets up all the files that you need to use package down. It creates this package down YAML default uh, file. And it just like, it just works. Like that is all you need to do. Yeah. You could learn to do, or you could make your package down site fancier. But at this point, as soon as I like check this all in and, and let it build, I will have a package down site for this. And what a package down site is, is if we look at um, this is the package down site for scenes. I didn't have to do anything to create this site. Like it's just using the readme for this page. Um, I have a vignette named scenes.rmd and it sees that and says, oh, okay, then we'll call that get started on the site. And then any other articles are in the, or any other vignettes go into the articles. It creates a pure or a function reference. Something that I can do is I could go through and like categorize these to put, make the function reference a little cleaner, but I don't like need to do that. It, it uh, sets that all up. Um, so yeah, that's all the steps. So we've made it through at least all of the steps of creating a package. Now I haven't actually done anything with the package yet, uh, but now it has all the things. The two things, so something I would need to do is I need to, I can't, um, I can't make the RM or the MD out of this. It, I get library social breaks. So either I would need to delete that or I can uh, build my package. Um, which my package doesn't have anything, but at least now it exists. And if I try to render, it will presumably work. Yes. Um, and so now <laughs> everything's broken. Our command check has not run at all yet. And so that one will be broken. But as soon as I upload this to uh, GitHub, it'll work. I'm actually surprised. I, I was wondering if use GitHub would have filled this in and it didn't. Um, so I'm surprised by that. I'll have to fill that in. Uh, but I mean, anyway, the rest of it's all set up. Um, yeah, it, it we ran everything. It, usually when it when you run the uh, code of conduct thing, it adds a uh, code of conduct piece to the readme and it didn't do that automatically. So I'll have to go see why that didn't happen. So there are little things that I need to clean up still. Um, but yeah, that set up the basics. Uh, yeah. Why didn't it add the GitHub install in when you used README? 
I don't know. Uh, so it, when I used README, it didn't because it did use README before use GitHub. I uh, so you didn't have a repo. So I, I've actually like um, I have done this where I, I play along with their version, and then I end up uh, deleting the README and rerunning some of these commands mm. because um, once you have all these things set up, it'll auto generate the README that's better, and so I'll yeah. probably do that here. Um, like I said, one of the things that if you do use readme RMD after you already have Git set up, it automatically makes sure that you always update the readme.md. I find that useful. Um, so there are some like order of operations things here. I like, I think a lot of it, they have autom like not automated, but, um, ingrained. And so they don't see it as being a problem, but some of these I, I think are a problem and I, probably would submit some um at least notes that yeah, like it should tell us hey this didn't happen automatically because of the order so mm. you might want to do this you know but as well i know that it does say use github in there but do, do they not recommend in package like the um book about packages like get the repo from github first and then do stuff so rather than our projects i um if you are creating a new package, I do recommend this order. Um, I would, wouldn't you like use GitHub or like create package from GitHub and then do use underscore tidy but, package or something? Uh, create package from GitHub is an existing GitHub repository. And so it would, it would have a package there already. So if you, if, once I'm done here, if you wanted to create your own local copy of this shiny social package to work on you would like use create create. yeah mm. um yeah so if, it's if you've got primarily like, for creative park yeah, yeah if you've got like an empty repo like that this is where my package is going to go so you've got a major repo and then you want to make so. from there because i i do it in the terminal i do git clone and blah 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 you're right. So I wonder if that's what they expect, like so that when you do do use tidy package, you would get the readme because you would already have linked to GitHub. But then it, it doesn't make sense because it then calls use GitHub. So mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it's the order of operations does cause a problem. Um something that they haven't, I don't think that they've sorted out yet is um GitHub does have a concept of templates. And that's what we did at my my last job is we had templates of all of like all the setup stuff for our packages. Um, and so instead, you know, equivalent to what this does, we, we would create a repository on GitHub using that template and then uh, create from GitHub to pull that mm -hmm. into our, uh, you know, to make a project out of that. Um, if you're creating a new package, I do think like the create tidy package, it's probably the way to go. Like I, it, it has some things that aren't perfect, but it's pretty close to what you want. And I think having done all this where we actually went through it, um, that that like being able to go in here and and see, okay, what did it di do? What did it not do? Um, I, I probably one of these days I'm going to make, you know, create John package <laughs> that I just put into my R profile. Um, and it does the same sorts of stuff, but maybe in a slightly different order, maybe, you know, I kind of think probably don't open it up in a new session, just activate the project right here in this same session. Cause if I'm creating it here, then this is the window that I'm ready to work in. And that way you would be able to put every step in, I think. Um, and if you're doing that, it lets you do things in like a better order. Like I, I would not do this until I had github normally um yeah and, but then so then you can't do the lifecycle badge until after that all these different things um it's and like i really think that's right thing as in there is this is there for a reason it's just understanding well why is it like that it's probably like you said like you can't guarantee some of these will work with use git and use github at the beginning yeah like you don't have someone's credentials and everything is set up and all that stuff so they yeah. still want to build the readme for you, but yeah, you know, it's it's just somewhat suboptimal. But it's maybe like you can't make it 
like it, you can't do it the other way around perhaps yeah yeah um sorry i was just like uh like if you could activate a project without um opening a new r studio session yeah so like basically if i could just new session equals false here everything else could run in order um would you risk overwriting a current project like is that possible no because when you do the create um create tidy package or create package if you are inside of an existing package or a project it would um it would uh uh like tell you no like it's saying it would mm -hmm. tell you that did you mean to do this and you have to choose yes out of the three options so uh i guess the the um set wd or whatever activating the project would be a thing um but you should be able to open it and so i'm, I'm curious actually so if i do our studio api open project uh, Keys new session is false. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, it does it does kill your R session even if it's not. <laughs> that's interesting. So new session was false, but not really. Mm -hmm. Like, um, or that was Studio API. Uh, I know, but new session is false, right? It. It's when you open a project in new session, you can run two R studios at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so it's I do get it. It feels like you're making a new yeah. session, but for them, new session is just adding a second session rather than like just persisting in the first one. Right. I I've got yeah. a I've got a run that I have to do right now because I have something later on. But yeah. thanks for this, John. Um yeah. I think that function is really cool. The use tidy package. Like I definitely just use that the next time I make a package. Yeah. Like, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. <laughs> so yeah. Um, it just, it just then, saves forgetting things yeah. like just, it just saves you. Yeah. And I'd actually, I think I'd rather have to go through and clean up. Okay. I don't actually want to say our studio and things. And I, you know, I'd want to have to remember that versus I don't have a code of conduct at all. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it, there is the balance. Like I, I, one of these days, I've either I want to do it or I want to keep poking at them to do it. Of uh, there should be a version of create tidy package that is, you know, create um, rigorous package or something that makes you answer some questions, but otherwise does all this. Mm -hmm. um, because it's things that pretty much everyone should do. They just shouldn't refer people to code of conduct at rstudio.com and you know things like that um so yeah it'd be anyway, nice if, right. could, if they could point to some like persistent resources that you you have i mean much as you kind of have uh your like the options of you know john Harmon, right. your email address etc well, so but uh, they're they're basically taking this from like the ins directory of the package instead of uh from some external source i guess right and, and you know they could be things that we have as use this um options that you could put in your profile and then it could just use those things um, or you could use some directory thing or, you know, different things like that. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I very much want that to exist. Uh, they did just like hire someone to uh, kind of be a package advocate. So maybe that kind of thing will happen. <laughs> so, um, cool. All right. I, I need to go as well. So. I will see everyone next week. Uh, we'll talk on Slack about what we're doing next week. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, have Thank a you. good weekend, everyone. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.